I grew up as a hacker. And by hacker, I mean somebody who can break into a computer. And my goal here today is to explain to you why I teach other people how to hack. So imagine a world filled with intellectually capable people who all share a common passion. And in this world, the only way you communicate is through a chat interface. So you have no idea who the person is on the other end. It could be a 13-year-old girl from Haiti. It could be a 37-year-old law enforcement agent from uh, Thailand. It could be artificial intelligence. You just don't know. But it doesn't even matter. You see, your background, your age, your sex, your class, your looks, none of that has any bearing in this world that I'm describing. The only thing that matters in this world is your knowledge, your skills, and your curiosity for understanding how the digital world works. So the world that I'm describing is the hacker underground, where I spent my teenage years. So what drew me to that place? What drew me to this world? Um, I'm sure at some point in your life, you must have tried to guess someone's password, right? Right? Anyone? <laughs> yes, right. Do you remember that feeling, that, that rush? That kind of euphoric sensation of accomplishment and power when you succeeded, right? It's the same kind of feeling that you would get uh, when you solve a complex puzzle or when you beat someone at chess, when you prove a mathematical theorem. It's, you feel as if somehow you outsmarted a real or imaginary opponent, right? So hackers get that same exact rush when they defeat someone's program to make it do something it was not intended to do, or when they gain unauthorized access to someone's system. And it's really not that hard to relate. I mean, Im imagine this, imagine this. You're, um, you're in your online bank, and you're about to transfer money to your friend. A just for kicks, instead of putting in the amount, you put in the number zero, just, just to see what happens, just for kicks, and nothing happens. And you persist. You keep at it, and you try to, uh, to try something else, and you start putting in letters instead of numbers. And again, the website blocks it. And you persevere, and you try again, and you try putting in a negative number just to see what would happen. And lo and behold, it goes through. And what have you done? Now, instead of you transferring money from your account to your friend, you've effectively taken money from your friend's account to put it into yours, right, without any notification. Can you imagine what you would feel like if you had just discovered this? <laughs> right. I'm sure you would feel surprised. I'm sure you would feel slightly elated. I'm sure you would feel like as if you outflanked an entire army of programmers whose only purpose it was to try to keep out people like yourself. And I'm sure you would feel a bit uneasy that it was this easy to defeat the security of the site to which you were trusting your money. Right? So most people I know would get a huge kick out of finding this type of vulnerability, but they wouldn't abuse it. They would just enjoy the process of finding this bug, and then they would report it. Unfortunately, that is becoming more and more accepted. As it turns out, this particular bug that I'm describing to you was real. It was actually found by my friend, who at some point just called me up like, hey, Emir, this is hysterical, man. Hey, look at your account. <laughs> Now look, now look at it again. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So, so he was doing this audit of uh, some internet security bank. Yeah, it was really funny. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I'm sure some of you can relate, but during your teenage years, you don't really have much of a, a moral compass. Somebody can relate to that, I hope. Right? So I was sitting at one point in my room, and I was hacking the server at uh, an Icelandic internet service provider. And some member of my family picked up the phone and was like, oh, Ymir, are you on the phone? Which disconnected me from the internet. This is from the time when everybody had modems, right? But moreover, it disconnected me from the server that I was hacking and left that server completely unusable and in such a state of disarray that I couldn't even get back into it. And I just remember sitting there, looking at my screen, feeling utterly devastated over what had happened. I had no idea what to do. I was just, I had this cancerous feeling of guilt in my gut. Just, I, I really had no idea what, what recourse I had. 
And I remember spending the entire night with my friends just discussing what to do. And it was decided that the following morning I would go to this company and tell them what I had done. And so in the morning I go with a friend, we catch the bus, and uh, we go to the place, we talk to the secretary, the secretary phones up the system administrator, and then we waited. And we waited. And it was the most agonizing wait that a 15-year-old could ever ask for. It was an experience that I will never forget. I remember thinking that there were two ways this could play out. The system administrator could be forgiving, he could scold us and be like, hey, don't hack my servers again, get out. Or he could be a lot more angry than that. He could react and uh, he could practically sue us. He could just steer us, he could label us as criminals, steer us on a path of just something very dark, just pretty much it would be over by then. As it turned out, the system administrator was an amateur hacker, was delighted to see us. He was like, whoa, that's really cool. And like, uh, we showed him how to fix his servers, and he was like, oh, that's really cool. And then instead of reacting with rage, he called us up a few days later and offered us a part-time job at the company, which <laughs> we, we kept for several years, and uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. Anyhow, um, as I grew older, my moral compass developed, fortunately. And uh, I moved away from hacking. And I studied mathematics at the university, and uh, did, went to the US and did a PhD in computer science. And when I came back, I realized that the state of security in Iceland was pretty much the same as when I had left. An utter mess. And so it was somehow as if Icelanders believed that this geographic remoteness that has sheltered us throughout millennia was somehow an effective protection against the forces of the internet. <laughs> which couldn't be more false. So I started thinking to myself, what can I do to improve the cybersecurity of my home country? And as I was searching for an answer to this question, I realized that there were lots of system administrators who were ultimately responsible for a lot of the security who felt reasonably safe against cyber attacks. And this belief was usually sustained by some sort of faith in an antivirus solution, or an elaborate firewall, or some security solution that they had just purchased for a lot of money. It must be good, it was really expensive. And I was just flabbergasted. I mean, can you imagine somebody telling you like, hey, my house is really secure, yes, yes, yes. I bought this really big steel door, and it's reinforced with unobtainium. Nobody can get inside. <laughs> and then when you drive past this home, you see this really big steel door, and then the windows are all open. That is how I felt when people said this to me. It was, uh, it was something else to listen to this. So, and then it really hit me that the way I was thinking about security was actually fundamentally different from the way they were thinking about security. You see, as a hacker, I am trained to ask, how would I get in? How would you defeat the defenses? Are there protections in place? Are these protections even enabled? Can I get around them? I'm trained to ask all these questions. I mean, ask yourself, how would you break into your own home? Have you ever, have you ever thought about that? Right? How would you do it? Like, or, or you can ask a friend. It turns out that if you ask this question periodically, you ask people that you trust, and then you do something about it, probably you're going to be having a safer home than if you just blindly believe in some security solution, that you could just buy security in a box. So, what I decided to do was that I wanted to uh, somehow transfer this mindset that I had, this hacker mindset, on to people, so that they could also see my perspective on things. And uh, what I decided to do was just to start teaching hacking. That I would teach how software breaks, how defenses get... Uh, get thwarted, and how people bypass all these new protections that are coming about, and how new protections come in their place, how this cat and mouse game is played out. Because you see, security is actually really hard. Because as a defender, you need to anticipate every possible way somebody might try to break in. But the hacker only needs to find one way in. Right? So what did I do? Well. I did three things. I had three approaches to try to uh, improve the state of affairs through 
teaching hacking. The first one is that I started teaching a university course at Reykjavik University, where every year we have 20 to 30 graduates who understand the very low-level details of what it is to hack and how things break and how to break them. They understand this cat and mouse game that's being played in the security industry. And these are the people that are going to be in critical roles at the Icelandic companies from time to come. And they're going to understand that like, hey, uh, firewalls are not actually very effective anymore. It's not going to be sufficient, right? These are the people that are going to be in these key roles making decisions, which now in this time of so many cyber attacks, we don't even hear all, about all of them. And in this time where we have industrial espionage raging and becoming more and more prevalent, these are the people that are going to make a difference. The second thing that I did was that I co-founded a company with some of my friends, great uh, security experts, that uh, is called Syndis. And uh, they specialize in um, simulating sophisticated cyber attacks against large international, large Icelandic corporations. And as a part of what we do, a part of our strategy, is that we try to take the people that work at these companies and Teach them the things that we do. Teach them how we defeat their, uh, defeat their defenses. So try to educate them with this hacker mindset that we have so that they too can understand the context of security a lot better. And clearly we were filling some sort of need because the biggest problem we've had at this company is to manage project workload. Now, the third thing that I did was that I started running hacking competitions. I'm sure maybe some of you have heard of any of them. Been running now for three years. So every year I put like a server on the internet and I ask people to hack it. And the people who succeed, uh, we, uh, we pick a few finalists, and they come on stage, and in front of up to 500 people, they are hacking each other live. <laughs> it's really fun, actually. There's like a live scoreboard, there's like a DJ, and there are commentators, and they have a lay audience that's looking at this really strange thing, right? And, uh, and uh, it's, it provides like, uh, several opportunities. There's some side effects from doing it this way. First of all, it's like really educational. And because you have this lay audience, you get this opportunity to teach people a thing or two about cybersecurity, raising the awareness of some of the latest things they should watch out for, some of the things they can do to protect themselves. And the second side effect of the way I'm, I'm doing things is that the participants, which are usually students, they learn an incredible amount in a very short period of time. You see, normally when I'm teaching computer architecture or I'm teaching operating systems, I have students that are like moaning. They're just like, ah, do we have to learn this? Will this be on the exam? <laughs> and they're like, you're like, yeah, yeah. But for this competition, I, I have people that are coming up to me, please, please, can you tell me everything you know about the computers? I want to know everything. I want to learn it all. Can you teach me how to, can you teach me how to hack? Oh, I had some Italian exchange students. I don't know if it's whatever it is. <laughs> no thanks. And, uh, and so, it's like incredible, in a very short period of time, how much they could absorb. I pretty much just taught them everything I know. And so the third thing that comes from running this type of hacking competition is that, um, is that the media really loves it. I, I talked to the media liaison at, at Reykjavik University, and it's like, yeah, so I'm gonna have this hacking competition. She's like, yeah, yeah. I, I contacted the media, and it was like selling ice cream in a desert. <laughs> They just flocked onto it like hyenas, and like everybody showed up. I remember like the first competition, I had two people, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna expect maybe 20 people to show up or something. You guys are gonna be on stage, and you're gonna be hacking each other. And then when they came there, there's like big cameras everywhere, and like this newscasters with like a lot of light around them and so forth. And these two guys were just frozen <laughs> on stage, trying to do something, you know, totally unprepared. It was really funny. Anyway. So it's, it's been really educational, really entertaining, and uh, I think it really has worked out for the better. But I know there's this lingering doubt in the back of your mind. There's this question, which is, wait a second, aren't you just arming people with digital weapons? Right? And to an extent, that's true. I am indeed teaching people skills that they could abuse. But so are chemistry professors. So is the police academy. So is your martial arts teacher. And just like these people, I am putting trust in my students. I'm putting trust that they're not going to abuse their skills. In fact, they have to sign a waiver that they're not going to do it for anything unethical. And I spend a lot of time with them trying to understand these ethical dilemmas that get created through the power that is hacking. 
Imagine, for instance, if you find an exploit that could make you walk into any computer on the planet. What would you do? Now, what would you do if somebody offered you $500,000 for it? A million dollars, right? These are real questions, and this is really how the environment works in the underground. So, I actually believe that I have swayed some people, some people whose moral compass was not fully developed, some people who were making choices that they might later regret, some younger versions of myself. I may have swayed them on a path where they are becoming constructive members of society and making choices that are improving the security of us all. And because there was somebody who did that for me many years ago, and something that I will never forget, and it's something that I want to pay forward, and that is why I teach people how to hack. Thank you.